Welcome to the Zoe Routh Leadership Podcast, where we share all things people stuff in leadership. Learn from leaders who have done the hard yards and learn from experience. Hear from expert authors about the latest insights from culture to strategy and messy people dynamics. Get tips and insights from multiple award-winning author and leadership expert herself, Zoe Routh. Now, on with the show. Well, hello, it's Zoe Routh, your friendly neighbourhood leadership expert, Canadian-Australian one, that is. Do I still sound Canadian after 25-odd years? Yep, I still think I do. (laughs) Well, first question for you is, do you trust the people you work with? Do you trust them to get the work done? Do you trust them that they're not, you know, flaking off when they're out of sight? Do they trust you? How can you tell? And more importantly, what can you do about it? And if you've broken their trust or they've broken your trust, how can you rebuild it? These are amazing questions that we get down and dirty with with today's guest. His name is Dr. Toby Travis, and he is an absolute delight. He is the creator and developer of the Trusted Leader 360 assessment, which goes through the strengths and areas for improvement for leaders according to the six components of trust, which we go through in the episode as well. Uh, He's the author of Trust Ed, The Bridge to School Improvement, available on Amazon in print and Kindle versions. Uh, So he's a writer, he's a columnist, and he's had had a wealth of experience and background in the school environment in the United States. And all the research that he did for his PhD applies directly to organizations, whatever level that you're in. So this is absolutely a delightful interview with somebody who's really delved deeply into this whole idea of trust. So let's get on with the show. Well, all the way from North Carolina, Dr. Toby Travis, welcome to the show. Thank you, Zoe. Great to be here with you. (laughs) I love this topic, trust. It's a big issue in teams and cultures. And I'm really interested in hearing what you have to say about how we build trust and how we rebuild trust. How did you get into this line of work? Because it's pretty specialized. Well, it really started from solving a problem or trying to be a part of solving a problem in the workplace where I was. Uh, I had come into an organization and realized very quickly that there were a lot of toxic behaviors and attitudes going on in that workplace. And within a relatively short amount of time, uh, I had the opportunity of stepping into leadership in that organization and literally just brought it to the table and talked to my fellow leaders and said, we've got a trust issue going on here between administration and the employees. What are we gonna do about it? And just recognized it first and then started to look for resources to give us guidance to address it. A dear friend of mine, uh, David Horsacker, wrote a, a bestseller here called The Trust Edge, number one in the Wall Street Journal a few years ago reached out to David just to give us some advice, and it was phenomenal, his work. But I also realized as he introduced me kind of into, okay, how do corporations deal with this? At the time I was and am working in education, I was like, okay, what? how do we specifically address this to the context of our organization? And that led to eventually giving me impetus to go into my doctoral program. And so my doctoral work and studies and research is actually in trusted organizational leadership and looking how do we assess it? How do we intentionally build action planning and concrete steps to address it? So that's kind of where it all began was trying to solve an issue within the organization that I was working. And then through that process, you know, just dove in deeply into the research and to the literature. And then through that, opportunities have just started to open up for me to walk alongside and and mentor and consult and encourage others. Great. Well, what a great place to start in terms of (laughs) trial by fire, really. The fact that you walk into an organization and there's a whole bunch of toxic behaviors there. I want to ask, like, what does it actually look like? So can you give some practical examples of what toxic behaviors look like? Yeah, when when leaders, and I'm using that term in a broad sense, really anybody in a supervisory role, and so it doesn't necessarily have to be the CEO, it, you know, it could be a manager level, 
when leaders and employees don't share a vision, you know, don't share a common focus, don't share values, this is where that toxic behavior comes up. People end up, you know, they don't trust that leaders have their back or leaders don't trust that employees are really caring about the company. They're just caring about their paycheck. That's where those toxic behaviors come in. It really comes down to beliefs and values is really the source of fundamentally where that toxic, uh, those toxic behaviors come from. And then how does it play itself out? It's, you know, it's the back talk. It's the undercurrent of, oh yeah, here we go again, you know, the rolled eyes and and really a lack of buy-in. In fact, I was recently looking at school improvement initiatives, what percentage of those fail, and the research shows about 70%, and then I went over and was looking at business initiatives, what percentage of those fail, interesting, it was the same number, 70%, Zoe. So the majority of improvement initiatives that we try to initiate in organizations and schools and businesses, they fail. (laughs) And when you start, then start digging in all the why, most of what we see is it's an execution. And then you look at, okay, well, why are those plans of execution in, in whatever the initiative fail? It comes down to leadership. You know, it's the old John Maxwell statement, everything rises and falls on leadership. And he's absolutely right. And when organizations fail to address how to shore up trusted relationships in the organization between employees and leadership, if they fail to do that, it doesn't matter what the initiative is, it's not going to be sustainable. So we've got to address that first. And then what we find is when you create a work environment or the school setting, a learning and work environment that is positive, that there are shared values, that the communication is clear and leadership is authentic. Yeah, all kinds of good things start happening. You know, it sounds so obvious and straightforward, you know, be decent, upright human being and being clear about what you're after and care about your people. Why do you think that so many leaders struggle with this? Well, I think some of it is an inability to be vulnerable. We see that as and it's just not true, but we see it as uh, it it reflects that I'm not a strong enough leader, right? It's it's like if I don't have all the answers. And yet the very opposite is what we find. I'm sure you're familiar with the work of Jim Collins, you know, in his classic now, you know, good to great, he talks about the level five leader as being someone who, yes, they're mission-centered, they're passionate, but the other major trait is they're humble. You know, they, they realize it's not about them. It's about supporting a team. And I think the reason we, so many leaders struggle to get to that point is because they think, no, I'm the professional. I'm, I'm the CEO. I was hired to be the guy or the gal to figure it out. And yet what we find is those types of leaders, they might have a burst of success, but it's not sustainable. Leaders who see their primary role as being support for those whom they manage or they lead, that's where we see sustainable success and ongoing growth. So I think part of it is a lack of willing to be humble, willing to allow others to speak into your life. It's a paradigm uh, shift for some that it's not about my leadership. It's really about being focused on the success of the team and the organization. Yeah, I, I think there's a lot of factors that work in there as to why do we fail to do it. Adam Grant talks a little bit about this in his latest book called Think Again. And he talks about the notion of having confident humility and uh, not just being humble where you can be self-effacing and not being so confident that you're arrogant. And I think this is a particular challenge for new leaders because how do you develop confidence if you haven't got the experience? And sometimes the adage of fake it till you make it is what carries you through. And because he said in his research too, if that you don't have experience and you admit that you don't know, this is actually counterproductive to your reputation and to building trust. So what's your advice for newer leaders who don't necessarily have the experience yet to feel confident in their roles so that they don't launch into all this humility and I don't know and give off the sense of, oh, how can we actually trust you because you don't have any experience and you're not confident in yourself? It's kind of like uh, you're damned you do, you damned you don't. What suggestions have you got for newer leaders? 
Well, it's actually the same suggestion or recommendation or counsel I would give to an older leader, and that is make sure you have got a mentor. Make sure that you've got someone that you can talk to outside of the organization. Uh, so this is not a board member. This is not a, another employee, but it's someone who understands your role, who understands what you're dealing with. So it needs to be someone who has familiarity with that level of leadership. But then we all need mentors, especially younger uh, leaders who are just coming into. Make sure you've got someone to talk to, to process that you're not trying to do it all on your own. But it's it continues to be one of those secrets of success. You know, you know, they used to label that. Even for experienced and mature leaders is what you find is, oh, they all have mentors and they're mentoring somebody else. So they've, they've got a place to process and to, to think through the issues where they don't have to be the one who's figuring it all out. We're seeing here in the U.S. right now, school superintendents are leaving in droves. In fact, this year, a recent study came out that 30% of current superintendents do not plan to renew their contracts. We've never seen those kind of numbers. Now, we've seen there has been a, a teacher and administrator shortage in the States for years, and the pandemic has just exacerbated the problem. But one of the main reasons, if not the main reason they're leaving, is a lack of support. They don't feel supported. And yet here they are, you know, they are the CEOs of their organizations. You know, they're, we're the doctors, right? I mean, we've got our EDDs and our PhDs and we're expected to be able to do it all. Well, the reality is they're just human beings who are struggling. None of us had pandemic 101 in our doctoral programs, right? <laughs> and so, you know, the last two years have just been extraordinary for everyone in business and education and nonprofits. These are extraordinary times. More than ever, we need social and emotional support. And my counsel to boards and business owners is make sure your top leaders have got support mechanisms, meaning they've got a coach, they've got a consultant, and it doesn't have to be a paid professional, but if that's what it takes, get that done, spend the money. It's worth every dime to make sure that they are supported. So back to your question, for the young and new leader, don't go it alone. Big mistake. Make sure if you don't already have a mentor, go find a mentor and make sure that you've got that person or persons to help process what you're going through. I think that's wonderful advice and to outsource your confidence to a mentor who's been there and done that <laughs> so that you don't have to rely on just pretending your way through. I think that's really helpful. Back to the essentials of trust, and you've mentioned a couple already, you know, being clear on your values and what's important and clear communication. What are some other, is, is there a step-by-step -step process to build trust or critical behaviors or skills that you need? Yes, and yes. <laughs> uh, it, you know, in the book, I, I use an analogy of a bridge. And actually, I always like to give my wife full credit. You know, I'd come through the doctor program and had come up with all this material. It's like, okay, how do we turn this into something people can actually get their, their minds around? And, and she says, sweetie, isn't it really just like a bridge? You've got to have all these components in it connected, working together and stable, and then trust is there. And it was really funny that she came up with that analogy because I have had a phobia of bridges ever since I was a child. And uh, you think about when you walk or when you drive onto a bridge, especially, you are making a life or death trust decision, right? You are trusting that the engineers and the maintenance of this bridge uh, are all in place. Well, same thing with leadership. There are, just like a, a large bridge, there are components that must be in place. And right, we've already talked about really what I call the foundation of leadership, which is beliefs and values. They have to be known and they need to be articulated. Other components of a bridge would include the substructure of a bridge. What's the function of a substructure? It is to connect and support all the other components of the bridge to the foundation. But this is where trust is often lost, is when leaders are not consistent in connecting and supporting everything that's going on in the organization to their stated beliefs and values. We say we believe this about employees, or we say we believe this about the customer, or we say we believe or have this value about how we're going to work together. 
But then if we don't live by that, if we don't ensure our systems and our practices and our protocols are authentically genuine to what we say we believe, we lose trust. Other components, go ahead. Yeah, I want to ask about systems because I think this is something that I see isn't always addressed in organizations well as a place where trust and culture can be built and where trust and culture can be broken down. When you're talking about systems and protocols, what kinds of ones do you see that are typically problematic and how do you fix them? Well, so for example, I was working with an organization and we were talking about values and and I said, well, what, you know, what's one of your highest values? And they articulated our employees. That's our highest value. And I'm like, absolutely. That's great. That's exactly the answer you want to hear because what you find is when organizational leaders and owners, business owners understand the, that their company is their employees uh, in school settings. So the teachers are the school, right? So we articulate the value of the employee or the teacher. But then I pull out their budget or their budget planning documents, and I find that payroll and benefits are not the major line item in the budget. It's like your budget is communicating a different value. And, you know, so it's those types of things. It's like this is what we, our highest value is our employees, but that's not where we spend our resources. Sorry, it's not authentic. Uh, so that type of thing. Or when you look at business systems or operations, are they based on trusting your employees? Or do you have protocols in place that are based on distrust? You know, uh, so logging your hours. Well, that basically is a system that's there because you don't trust your employees. And my counsel is, if you don't trust the employee, why did you hire them? Right? Treat them as professionals. This is an interesting question, you know, especially in remote work environments, because the whole big issue, how can I trust they're actually doing their work? And so all these systems that people could adopt, such as time-based screen capture, so you can see what employees are doing hour to hour, that was one element, or frenetically checking in on them every hour, see where are you, what are you doing? So those are symptoms of control, I guess, because you're fearful of what people are doing. So how do you unwind all of that stuff? How do you set up the systems in place so that you feel like you can trust employees and employees feel trusted, especially in remote work and in hybrid teams? Well, of course, the in most of those settings where people are doing remote work, it, it is project-based, right? There is an end game of what they're supposed to be producing. And, and it's complex, so I don't, I don't want to be simplistic here. It really does look different with every, every company, business, organization, or school. So you really have to really get into the weeds on this to solve problems. But a place to start is just to look at all of our operations. What of our operations and practices are based on distrust? Start there. So just reviewing, okay, our, we've got this protocol or practice or procedure, is it there because we don't trust our employee? Well, then that raises a whole a bigger issue, right, of HR. It's like, well, if you don't trust them, then why did you hire them? So it, it starts with hire well, support well. And, and what we find is when you treat people as professionals, most times they step up to it and deliver. So then focus on what is the objective, what is the expectation, set very clear expectations, very clear benchmarks, uh, very clear thresholds. In other words, okay, we've got this project and this is what I expect to see happen next. And this is when we're going to check in to see that it's there and then let them go. And if they deliver, great. If they don't, we've really got another conversation to have. And it's, is this a right fit? Are you the person who can get this job done? That, that's a better place to be than, again, this micromanaging, punching the clock. If you have to do that, you've hired the wrong person. So let me share a story of an experience I had, and I'd love your insight into what could have happened differently. So I was a middle manager in a in small organization. We had some systems that were based on distrust, as he said. And I just remember this one incident so clearly where one of the person I supervised came to me with an approval form. I'm like, what's this? 
She's like, I need to get your approval to take an hour off to go to the dentist and had to fill out a form. I'm like, oh my God. I'm like, are you kidding me? <laughs> like, A, what a huge waste of resources to actually have to fill out a form, use the paper to do it and get it to file, be filed and processed. And I just looked at her and I'm like, I completely trust that if you need to do the dentist, you'll go and do the dentist and manage your work around that. But I was stuck in a system that was established and I wasn't the CEO and didn't have the authority to change it. And as a manager sitting there in that position, I'm like, I wait up, is it worth me fighting to get this changed or not? Like there's only so much energy you have to fight different battles. So what would your advice to have been to a middle manager like me who's stuck in a system that they don't have authority to change? You control what you can control. And you, you do look and wait for opportunities to speak into bigger issues. All of us have limited authority. I mean, very few of us, even at the CEO level, right? There's still, uh, there's a board to be accountable to. There's shareholders, et cetera. So no, my, my counsel in that situation would be support the employee. Make sure they know you've got their back. And even if you disagree with the system, you know, no, you say, no, sure, absolutely. I trust you. You know, one of the things we've learned about repairing trust is it's done through extending trust. So a lot of my work is folks reach out to me because trust has been broken and they're looking for how do we assess this? How do we action plan this thing back to a place of health? Well, one of the steps in restoring trust is extending trust. So in that role, I would just say, no, you, you did the right thing as far as just extend trust to the employee. Look for opportunity to speak into changing that. But if that is you know, above your pay grade, as it were, no, you may not be able to fix it, but you can model and demonstrate you know, a healthy relationship with employees that are directly answering to you. Extending trust is a way to rebuild trust if somebody has broken your trust. What if you're the one who has broken somebody else's trust? How can you go about rebuilding the relationship there. Yeah, well, this is, again, part of the work. It sounds simplistic, but it's really true. And then and it goes like this, make promises and keep them. And so when I'm working with a leader who has, they've blown it, they messed up, and they have broken, you know, through their behaviors, actions, decisions, they broke trust. First of all, own it. And, you know, Jim Collins, be humble about it, you know, own it. And then we'll, we talk about in our sessions and, okay, what promises can you make to these individuals that you can carry through on in the next few weeks, the next few months? Usually, we're, again, we're working on short-term improvement plans are, are really the most successful. You build a culture of success through make a promise, deliver. Make a promise, deliver. Make a promise, deliver. And that element of trust being rebuilt, it takes time. And that's another element that we've learned is you've got to be willing to be in it for the long haul. Some studies have shown it can take as, as long as seven months to build just a foundation, a, kind of a, a ground level of trust between leaders and their employees. So when we're talking about restoring trust, it may take even longer. Uh, but how do you do it? You make promises and you keep them. And you just keep doing that over and over. Thank you. That just makes life so much easier to remember that mantra. And it makes me think about the promises that I've made and haven't been able to keep. And I was like, oh man, I'm just burning up my trust collateral, my trust bank account by not being able to do that. And I love the other adage that goes along with that is under promise and over deliver. <laughs> So that you don't catch yourself short. You don't promise the world and then fall short every time. So I love this um, question too. Like there's this, I don't know, idea that people leave leaders, not organizations. And my opinion on that is that it's a bit of both, you know, that, yeah, your relationship with your direct manager is significant in terms of your work experience. And at the same time, that's just one sub experience within the greater cultural context. When it comes to people leaving because they're disgruntled, what do you think the balance of, you might have the research around this, I'm not sure. What do you think the balance is in terms of how much does the manager's contribution, the negative contribution, how much does the organization's negative contribution contribute to someone's departure? 
Yeah, well, we have seen this in, in multiple studies. So, right, we can look at the data. The data tells us, right, the number one reason people leave is because they don't feel supported by their, their direct you know, supervisor. Obviously, if that's a telltale sign of the organization, it can be even even broader. Yeah, I don't trust this organization. You know, I don't trust the ownership. I don't trust the board. Uh, it can go beyond just our own personal experience. Again, it looks different from business to business or organization to organization. I've seen in the world of education, teachers who will hang in there for really little compensation. You know, when we, we look at is it the best career move for them? No, but if they have a, a principal or a coordinator who believes in them, supports them, sees that they're well-resourced, is defending them and being their champion, they'll stay in that school for years and years. Yes, they could be chasing a paycheck someplace else, but they, they love teaching, they love kids, and they've got an administrator who has their back they're gonna stay in that school. Same thing we find in business environment. People will stay in less than ideal jobs of, again, compensation or benefit levels if it's a healthy and vibrant work environment. And, and, and they know, no, oh, my boss loves me. You know? and my, I will come here to play. And that is the major factor for most people when it comes to retention rates. Okay, so I think you answered my question. If I can summarize this correctly, just check me if I got it right. So that a good manager can provide a bit of immunity in a bad culture. So you can have a little mini microcosm of positivity within a negative culture, but not necessarily the other way around. So if you have a bad manager in a great culture, you won't necessarily survive that. Right, yeah. Well, and rarely do you see those two going together at least not for long. I mean, if you've got an organization that has been very intentional and diligent in protecting a high level of trust and, and positivity and well-being, I like that phrase, in the workplace, and you have someone who has come into a leadership role that is not supporting those values, is not living it out, well, they're probably not going to be in that role very long. The other thing I was thinking about this too is that having worked with a really fantastic group of leaders, like they were extraordinary, really passionate, very clear, very humble, et cetera. However, their industry was really challenged in terms of the pressures that are within it, the expectations on the staff to deliver. It was hard to attract people into the industry because of the workload. So there was this negative context in which even these fantastic managers in a fantastic organization we're trying to navigate. What do you do with that? Yeah, it's, and well, <laughs> and you know, if you and I figure that one out, we're, you know, <laughs> we're, we're gonna write a book together and help so many because isn't that a big part of what's going on right now in the employment shortage uh, in the pandemic? In fact, uh, I just had a conversation with a gentleman that writes for Forbes and we were talking about how folks are hesitant to go back into the workplace because they know there's a lack of workers or a lack of specialists uh, or whatever the, the situation may be. And therefore they know no, they don't trust that employers are gonna take care of them, but rather they're just gonna dump the work on them because we all know there's not enough people to get the work done. Well, and so this is this cycle of we don't have enough workers and people aren't coming back into the workplace because we know we don't have enough workers. You know, it's just like, oh my goodness. There is not an, again, I don't think there is an easy remedy to this. Uh, I think we're going to be very, very intentional as employers that as we interview and as we seek out candidates to come into, we also need to make sure that there are buffers in place to ensure that they, their time and energy is protected and that they're not going to be taken advantage of. I, I think about restaurant owners. I think some of the most brilliant things that have happened with restaurant owners is they've trimmed their hours of service and their capacity in order to protect their workers. And I think they are going to see a long-term payoff with their employees because they elevated the needs of their employees above the bottom line uh, and even above the wishes and desires of their clients because 
they will remember this. Their employees will remember this. This pandemic will pass. Uh, you know, Lord willing, we will get through this in, in uh, another year or two or however long it takes. But employees will remember how did the owners, how did the boss, how did the board value our efforts and our work capacity? And, and those organizations and leaders who do that, I think they're going to see the wonderful residual of loyal employees who, you know, again, will stay committed, even if it's not ideal, if they know, no, my, my leader, my, my boss, my supervisor, they are restructuring how we do things in order to ensure my well-being. That will pay off. Mm. I think, as you said that, the, the solution emerged in, in your answer in that it's, it's all about managing expectations, uh, managing expectations with, with your clients, with your service providers, all that kind of thing, and saying, this is our new context. We won't be able to deliver because, well, in some cases here, and it's likely the same in the U.S., 40% of the workforce is laying low with COVID. So, <laughs> you know, yes, we're going to be behind on our deadlines because our workforce can't come to work. And I think being clear about managing those expectations is going to be, is pretty critical. And I love the other thing that you put in there is that some organizations and leaders have said, we're going to change the way that we deliver to make sure that we look after our staff. And I think that's amazing. So I have another really important question here. How do you assess leaders' level of trust? You know, it's like, how trusted am I? What metric are you using for that? Well, this was actually my doctoral work. So, so you're asking me the golden question there because that was the question I asked at the beginning. You know, when I first started getting into this, it's like, okay, we know this is a trust issue, but you know, if you ask, play the word game, you know, I say trust, you think of, well, you're going to hear all kinds of things. And what you, what you find is trust is very complex. So this is, you know, why we worked on developing, and I'm saying we, although my name is on it, because there were so many that helped me in the process of developing this framework. We've developed a framework of these six components of trust. And then we looked at the research, we looked at the literature and identified specific skill sets within, and not just skill sets, but also competencies within these six components so that we could develop uh, basically an assessment tool. And so we've developed a number of what I would refer to as a 360 assessment. So we could come into an organization and push out a tool, a survey tool to employees about their leaders. And there are 48 questions. They're all research-based and evidence-based and validated. And we collect, okay, what do you think about your supervisor in this question uh, regarding their practices in leadership? And from that, and there is no perfect assessment, I always like to say that, but it gives us data then to look at the strengths and areas for improvement in these six components of trusted leadership. And so there are assessment tools, and, and mine's not the only one. There, there are several organizations that have developed trust assessment tools that are out there, and we use these then to do reflection, analysis, and then action planning. Okay, so it's, here it is, you know, kind of the, the so what, now what, and using that data to drive personal, professional, organizational improvement plans. And then we do some action planning, we put those actions into work, and then we reassess and recalculate and keep building. And through that process, now, we've seen some wonderful things uh, happen and some really exciting turnarounds of some organizations that were struggling in a relatively short amount of time, I would say. They saw, again, not just a workplace well-being increase, but also the bottom line. And, of course, that's what we all want to see. We want to see, the, at least in the, in the business and corporate world, we want to see our, our bottom line. But it doesn't even have to be that. I, I worked with nonprofit organizations. Again, I, I talk a lot about reaching mission fulfillment with well-being. And when you can have both, that's the sweet place. That's where you want to be. Uh, so, But yes, it can be assessed. There is data that we can look at to help us know, no, this is the level of trust in these components, and we can begin to address them. Cool. So you mentioned the six components of trust. <laughs> It's like a little dangling, a little hook in front of me. I'm like, okay, what are they? Okay, very quickly. Again, we've already talked about a couple of them. Foundation, beliefs and values. 
substructure, supporting and connecting. The bearings of trust. This in a bridge, you don't see the bearings, but this is the, these are the movable parts. Here we're talking about flexibility and being involved. Girders of trust. This is the idea of contextualizing and adapting. You know, there's a lot of talk in, in leadership and in education. We talk about best practice. What we've learned, though, is best practice must always be contextualized to the unique setting of the organization, the company, or the school campus. This is why larger school districts really fumble the ball. They try to make decisions for a bunch of schools at a district level in the name of equity, right, or address. And the problem is every school campus is unique. And we've got to make sure decisions on policies and procedures and practices are being made at the closest level to where the action is happening. So the girders of trusted leadership is all about the ability to contextualize and adapt to the needs of our current employees, our current clients in the school setting to these students, these current students in front of us uh, and the families that we're serving. Superstructure of trust is the most visible. You know, on a bridge, the superstructure of what you see from miles away. Here, what we're talking about is culture and relationships. And there's an old marketing adage that goes, if you don't tell your story, somebody else will. And here is that idea of being intentional in driving the culture. And we have found, and there are some excellent studies that support this, it actually takes very few people to drive culture if it's intentional. You know, there's lots of books on change management and, and, and very valid. And, and there's been some magic numbers thrown out. You know, you've got to get the 13% or you've got to get the 39%. What we've actually found is if you have core leaders who are unified in vision and mission and values, they know where they're going and they know how to communicate it and articulate it. Yeah, this is the superstructure. It's building a culture, building it through relationships. The sixth component is the deck. Uh, again, the, the deck and a bridge looks simple, but talk to any architect or engineer. They'll tell you it's anything but simple. <laughs> and trusted leaders take the complex and make it understandable. They have the ability to give us clarity of direction. We know what lane we're in. We know where we're going. And the systems are orderly and clear and authentic to who we say we are. So there you go. Foundation, substructure, bearings, girders, superstructure, and the deck. And here's here's the kind of the fly in the ointment though, Zoe, is what you've also learned, you've got to have all six or trust isn't going to be there. You know, think about it. You, you may have somebody who can articulate their values and beliefs very well. They might even be very good at analyzing our procedures and our operations to make sure it's consistent with who we say we are. But if they do not have the skill set in building relationships, in driving positive culture, if they do not have the skill set or competencies of order and clarity, no, we're not going to trust them. Again, this is why it's a framework to assess and ensure all six of those elements are in place with leadership teams. Okay. Wow. Thank you so much. That was very generous, Cher. I appreciate that. Uh, so the last question is, what podcast or book recommendations do you have, including your own, and where can people find out more about you? Uh, well, lots of books that I could, but uh, again, we've already mentioned, you know, some of my favorites, you know, Good to Great, it's a classic. Uh, Simon Sinek's work, you know, Start With Why, wonderful book. David Horsocker's The Trust Edge, great resource uh, for business leaders. Myself, my book, uh, Trust Ed, The Bridge to School Improvement, available on Amazon. It is not just for school leaders. Schools are the object of all the examples that are in the book, but what you'll find is, and the feedback that I'm receiving is, again, business, corporate, organizational leaders uh, can use the framework. How to find me, trustedconsulting.org is uh, where you can find me or on LinkedIn, just put in my name and you can find me there too. Dr. Toby Travis, that was extraordinary. Thank you so much for sharing all your wisdom and insight and thank you for doing this work. It's so incredibly valuable and much appreciated. My pleasure. What a delightful conversation. I so enjoyed that. And I'm sure Toby and I could have talked for ages more about 
experiences <laughs> around trust and lack of trust and what we can do to rebuild it. So two takeaways for me. One, the simple, easy to remember one is to build trust, keep your promises. Love that. It's an easy to do one. And the second one is to really dive more deeply. This is like the longer, bigger picture piece into the six components of trust around your beliefs and values, what kind of support you're offering, flexibility in the workplace, how you're adapting, contextualizing your initiatives into the organization, really honing and managing your culture and relationships well, and making the complex understandable and easy to digest. So those are the components of trust that you need to work at day by day. And the big one is keep your promises. Love it. Well, this show has been brought to you by all of the events that we are hosting here at Intercompass. And this weekend, uh, we've got, and next week, we've got a couple of online events that you may be interested in diving into. The first one is called Elite Executive Teams. That's an online workshop that you can jump onto. Just go to zoerouth.com, click on programs, and then click on events, and you'll find all the information about there, and that's where you can register. And the other one is another online event. There's also one in Canberra on the same topic, Hybrid Team Success. So it's the theme for amplifiers for this quarter, how we actually lead culture, particularly in a hybrid virtual environment. And uh, this will give you a little insight into what we're looking at in amplifiers and also tell you a little bit more about the program. Amplifiers is our advanced leadership training development program in a community-based setting for CEOs, managing directors, and senior executives who are big thinkers with big hearts who want to make a big difference. And if that's you and you're looking for a community for support that you can lean on so you can outsource your confidence and get the conviction that you need to take the action that you need to get on with to deliver amazing impact, then this is a community for you. Check us out. Uh, you can find out more at zoeroth.com. You know what? In the meantime, thank you so much for tuning in. It's always a pleasure to know that these podcast interviews are making a difference in helping you lead better. So on that note, live well, lead well. You've been listening to the Zoe Routh Leadership Podcast with leadership expert Zoe Routh. For more about people stuff and to contact Zoe, go to zoerouth.com.au.